Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the garage and the court of public opinion. Peter Clayton is with me. I'm Jeremy Cordeaux. And this podcast or posting, whatever you like to call it, whatever medium you are watching it on. I mean, if it's if you're watching it, it's uh, Facebook. If you're listening to it, it's a podcast acquired from your favorite podcast. What is he, a retailer or <laughs> applicator? <laughs> Platform. <laughs> Platform. <laughs> okay. Ah, oh, dear, oh, dear. I'll get the lingo one of these days. One of these days. The program or the posting or the presentation that says the things that you might be thinking, but no one else is saying. Uh, before we get into the news of the day, <coughs> March the 14th. Happy birthday. Wedding anniversary, day of celebration, hope it's a good one. On this day in 1931, the first theatre was built for rear projection in New York. Because they had movie theatres with the bio box, the projection box at the back, projecting on the front. I wonder why they came up with a rear screen projector. Anyway. It, they built the first theatre on this day in 1931. Not that you see or hear a lot about theatres these days with rear screen projection. Um, yum, 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 yum. Billy Crystal, the American actor, writer and producer. City Slickers. That was good. When Harry met Sally. Was that the one with I'll have what she's having? I think so. <laughs> yes. One of the truly great moments in movies. It is one of the best. Best lines, best isn't it? Lines. Oh, fabulous line. I'll have what she's saying. <laughs> uh, American Sweethearts. Um, he was in that too. Born in Long Beach, New York, on this day in 1948. 1995, for the first time, 13 people were in space. 1995, so that means Lost in Space was not true. That old damn family up there, didn't they? I think so. Uh, 2018, NASA, they had, oh hang on, that's interesting. NASA's twin study found that Scott Kelly is no longer identical to his twin brother because of the one year he spent in space. He ended up with 7% of his genes altered because he was in space for a year. That would kind of put you off space travel, wouldn't it? I wonder what it would be in, in, in is it the weightlessness? Is it the God, you wouldn't want to make that too public, would you? Take the edge off going into space? But that was in 1995. Stephen Hawking, English physicist, black holes and uh, all sorts of things. Brilliant, unbelievably clever man. Dies at 76. 2018. He died. JFK's bodies moved from a temporary grave to a permanent memorial in 1967. Quincy Jones, there's a famous name of music and entertainment. Quincy Jones, 1933, American jazz trumpeter, composer, arranger, record producer. He did lots and lots of work for Michael Jackson, Frank Sinatra. You name him if he was a star, Quincy Jones was the guy behind it. He did the uh, song, We Are the World, you remember that? Film producer as well, he produced Color Purple. Born in Chicago, Illinois on this day in 1933. Albert Einstein, German-born theoretical physicist, famous for his theory of relativity, uh, and E equals MC squared and all of that, won the Nobel Prize for physics in 1921. He was born in Germany. He died in 1955, but can you imagine if Adolf Hitler hadn't <coughs> picked on the Jews and he escaped from Europe in 19, 
33, I think, went to America as a refugee. Welcomed with open arms, as you could imagine. Um, you don't find too many Nobel Prize winners on the run looking for a home. Uh, they won't have to look for too long. But can you imagine Hitler would have had the atomic bomb if he hadn't gone around picking on Jews? George Eastman, <clears throat> the American inventor Kodak cameras and the founder of Kodak Eastman, the company, dies. He shot himself. Shot himself in the heart. He was 77. 1932 was the year. Uh, Eli Whitney patents the cotton gin, revolutionizes the cotton industry, and in particularly the southern states of America, in 1794. 1794. Michael Caine, 1933, English actor, Alfie, he was in Batman, he in lots of things. Oh, lots and lots of things. Great actor. Never played anything but himself, of course. If that's acting. Don't know. He was born in London in 33. The world's oldest golf club, Muirfield in Scotland. In 2017, votes to admit women for the first time in 273 years. <laughs> oh, dear. Why would you preclude 50% of the population, I wonder? Very silly. And Peter Graves. Peter Graves, 2010. American actor, Mission Impossible, Airplane, uh, Starlight 17, and lots and lots of other movies as well. Um, he dies of a heart attack. He was 83. Uh, you know, he was James Arness's brother. They were brothers, James Arness, who was in Gunsmoke. I don't think James Arness ever made any movies, but he certainly made his name in television. Anyway, <coughs> some of the things for which I remember the day. I'm losing my voice. <coughs> Excuse me. We were talking about that wonderful letter that Jacinta Price wrote to uh, Peter Clayton. Um, you never told me why she wrote to you, Peter. I don't know why she did. Well, Peter doesn't even know why she sent him the letter, but there it was. Um... Lots of interesting response. Um, <laughs> I remember, I remember clearly having Ernie Dingo on my program years ago, and he was telling me he couldn't believe how the joke he started when he, in one of his stand-up comic routines, comic shows, he did a welcome to country. You know, the original owner's sort of thing. He couldn't believe that it caught on the way it did and in such a few short years. But it is absolutely everywhere. It's endemic. He couldn't believe it. But I don't think it's funny anymore. We're all Australians. The country belongs to all of us. The only land we own is the land we buy. <laughs> no one comes into the world with a, a birthright to have land. Aboriginals have a particular position uh, where they have exercised their rights and have ended up with ownership or, um, what can I call it, legal title to 51%, a bit over 51% of the land mass of Australia. Most people don't know that. It's a lot of land. My golly. Now, if you go to New South Wales Art Gallery website, this is, this is just outrageous, I think. You go to the New South Wales Art Gallery website, you actually have to press a button accepting the fact that you acknowledge Aboriginal ownership or you cannot proceed. You know, proceed online, I mean. They'd wait a long time for me to press that button, I tell you. I don't think any Australian should be asked to do that. The Art Gallery of New South Wales is owned by the taxpayers. Owned by all the citizens of that state, or you could argue the entire country. No one else. No one has any special rights or privileges. 
particularly not based on the colour of one's skin. Now that, as Jacinta Price was saying in that letter that I read you yesterday, is racism. Pure and simple. Here's an interesting one. The state government in South Australia wants to make language gender neutral. You know, no more chairman, no more ladies and gentlemen, no more his and hers. I suppose no more boys and girls. Gender neutral. Why? How many people involved in Parliament, because they're talking about the rules governing what is said and done within those four rather plush, luxurious walls, how many people involved in Parliament are, what can I say, um, on the spectrum or gender confused? And indeed, if you are doing this in consideration of the entire population, you're changing the language that you use in our House of Parliament to placate, if placate is the right word, I don't even know if you've been lobbied by anyone to do this, but it happens to be 0.001% of the population. Some sort of weird tokenism or sexism or just plain insanity. Don't you have more important things to worry about, I wonder? Gee whiz. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? A Senate subcommittee has recommended a four-day working week. Have you seen this? A four-day working week with no reduction in pay. And, oh, by the way, uh, the boss is not allowed to call you outside office hours. And 52 weeks paternity leave. Well, 52 weeks, that because the male gets it as well as the female. Maternity, paternity. 52 weeks. So I decide to get married and we decide to have a baby and the taxpayer has to pay me for a whole year's work. No, I see. The boss has to pay me for a whole year's work and I am not there. My wife is not working, I'm not working, but we're both being paid 52 weeks paternity leave. In a country at a time where we need increased productivity and harder work, they are suggesting that we do less and for the same money. Where is the logic of that? Oh, I see, I see some sort of historic logic. Uh, the old trade union dream or mantra, less work for more money over the shortest number of hours, which of course is no way to build a company, let alone a country. And these clowns are in charge. We talked about International Women's Day last week and I saw over the weekend they had various events. Uh, Virgin Airlines, for example, thought an entire uh, female cast <coughs> was a good idea. Women baggage handlers, uh, women cabin crew, pilots, co-pilots. Now, I don't know if that impressed anybody, but it looked like a bit of a stunt to me. It certainly got the media interested. How do you create equality of the sexes while being sexist? But just on the subject of International Women's Day, did you hear? Among the tokenism, campaigning, pontificating, speech-making, did you hear anyone talk? or mention the number one international crime against women? Hmm? Did the UN say anything about it? No woman's organization that I heard about or read about? I'm talking about female genital mutilation that affects and destroys the lives of 200 million young girls and women around the world every year. Wouldn't you imagine that would be a fantastic platform that day, that celebration, to actually, as an opportunity, mention it for somebody to stand up and say, do something about it? 
Well, we, of course, do at every opportunity here in the court of public opinion, but what Pete and I sort of specialise in is talking about the stuff that no one else seems to want to talk about. I could be uh, way out of line again, but as a taxpayer it disturbs me that the ABC could, could be so good at what it does, if it chose to be. But in reality, it is a lobby for the left, a loudspeaker for the left, a source of great employment for the left, and somehow, strangely, it doesn't seem to understand the difference between reporting and campaigning. There's a huge difference. And it's so funny that they think no one notices the difference between reporting and campaigning. That's disgraceful. Either somebody's asleep at the wheel or the whole thing has been hijacked. And I don't know how that could happen. And could I suggest that when the ABC goes looking for a comment or a response or an interview, stop getting advice and comments and input from left-wing think tanks all the time. Do it sometimes. Balance. Why not try somebody in the middle, somebody on the right? Try to find some middle ground when you seek an opinion or a response. I don't know about other conservatives, but what you do offends me, really? Because it's our money. When particularly I know how good you can be, if you want to be, just drop the, the agenda. Be an excellent start. I think the last person who tried to reform the ABC was Jonathan, Jonathan Shire, I think his name was. Pete, does that ring a bell? Not with me, no. Jonathan Shire. He was uh, appointed, I cannot, I cannot even tell you, it might have been John Howard who appointed him. But I remember they broke him. He left in tears. And I never heard or read anything about him since. But he left a broken man. I remember what he said. He said he could do nothing. The animals had taken over the zoo. Colourful, colourful description. But if it's right, I'd have, to, I'd have to ask, how did it happen? Why did it happen? Why was it allowed to happen? Thank you so much for viewing the Court of Public Opinion, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be back tomorrow. Believe in yourself. I'm Jeremy Cordeaux. Thanks for viewing. See you soon.